Hello, everybody. Um, thank you to AWE for this amazing opportunity. It's been a long-term dream of mine to, to be able to deliver a talk at AWE and, and to have that talk be the lead-off talk for the enterprise segment. It, it really is a dream come true. Um, <clears throat> I decided to use the XROG uh, label that has been getting put on me for the last number of years and, and really uh, embrace that and maybe use the OG as old guy. So when they asked me to give this historian talk, I was like, okay, what would an old guy say? Um, and, and really it, it, it comes down to what, how XR has gotten so much easier than from what it was when I was a kid and, um, and, and the uphill both ways mantra. So without further ado, uh, I am a senior fellow at, at uh, Collins Aerospace. I work in applied research and technology. I've been in the advanced visualization space since 2000. I joined Collins Aerospace, which was Rockwell Collins, a small portion of Collins Aerospace back in 2001. And I have been doing XR since 2005. So like so many in my generation who uh, have been become experts in the XR space, I had no dream that this was going to be a part of my career path at any point in time. I joined Collins Aerospace as a manufacturing engineer. And in the process of, of uh, that job as kind of a side hustle, I started inventing these advanced visualization apps like an autonomous Andon system. And if you don't know anything about Andon systems or manufacturing, this is a system where somebody flips a switch, it turns a light red, everybody stops what they're doing and they go out and fix what the problem is. The problem with that is that people don't like to admit that they have a problem. So what this system did was it said, hey, there's a problem out there. You need to get on it and you need to get that thing working. So um, this most stubborn of metrics with the help of this application, this visual an analytics app, uh, kind of broke productivity metrics uh, loose. And we went from having a, a goal that no one thought we would be able to do to having a stretch goal that we also exceeded. And <clears throat> despite that uh, helping to earn me engineer of the year in 2003, I thought that it was a good idea to go into management because that's what technical people do. They go into management. And uh, it wasn't very long in that path and I, I, when I was having these realizations that, look, I can contribute more to the company as a technical leader than I can as a people leader. And at that point, I was going down this hall that you see here in the middle and I passed a person who had been trying to recruit me into our advanced manufacturing group for several years. And I said, if I was interested in coming into this group, because I keep having these ideas for these advanced visualization apps, um, would there be a place for me? And he wanted me into that door that you see there on the left and the light turned on and what you see there on the right is what I saw. And he said, we just installed our first virtual reality lab. I just put in my two week notice and the only name that I gave them to replace me was you. And I was like, what's virtual reality? <laughs> very, very nearly, not quite. So when I interviewed for the job, I took that exact game controller right there, sat down and was able to navigate through a virtual environment and they said, you got the job. And that's how I found my way into XR. So back in the day, it was a luxury to be able to hire somebody who had XR experience. Uh, more often than not, we were made, and I'm certainly one of those that was made. So um, <clears throat> back in the day, it was very difficult to get started in this space. On the left-hand side there, you see what our lab looked like at the time. We had this old school three you know, CRT projector, projector. It took about uh, three to four hours a month to be able to keep it calibrated. It was very difficult to, to do. Uh, the head mount display there, you see in the center, that is an SR80 from none other than Collins Aerospace, my company. And at the time, it was one of the best head mount displays on the market. Um, still very well loved by a lot of people in the XR domain. And it was $35,000, so not, not cheap. The software was uh, a little bit of a pain, to, to say the least, back in the day. And uh, this one in particular, there was a point in time where in order to get it to launch, you had to click the splash screen in the split second that it was on or else it wouldn't launch the rest of the way. 
So um, things have changed a lot in, in, in the time since. Now, why did we, uh, why were we interested in XR? On the left, you see what was our exact design for, for assembly, DFA checklist. And this is what we used on all of our, all of our designs um, <clears throat> before we would bring things into the factory. And the problem with that checklist was that, you know, like question three, this is small text, so I'll read it out, out loud. Are chassis, uh, are chassis mounted connectors visible prior to assembly? You can't answer that question until you've assembled something. You can't answer that question pre-production. And so this was a token effort. We gave it our best. We always went through this, but it was never effective. It was never effective to the point that Herm Renega over there on the right, when um, he just got fed up and he said, we've got to have a way that we can have our very first prototype have the ease of assembly of a full rate production unit. And I think that that's something that Herm probably got that vision from Toyota because I read a very similar vision um, about the time that I joined the team that had come out from Toyota, very noble vision. Um, and so we started using commercial off the shelf technologies and went through that for about four years. And what we found was that when you're making small stuff, and this is what the majority of what our part of Collins Aerospace was doing at the time, things that were about the size of a loaf of bread, it cost too much, it took too long, and it just wasn't effective in helping us find those problems. So um, <clears throat> back in the day, if it wasn't for somebody like Herm getting involved, an executive getting involved, it was something that, you know, good luck getting started in XR. About the time that we were about to pull the plug on this entire initiative, um, our boss and Kurt Chipperfield's boss at John Deere, they're, they, they're non-competitor, they don't, we're not in the same markets, um, they thought that it would be a good idea to get us together and start talking with each other. And so uh, Kurt was a, a lowly VR engineer, same as me back, uh, back then, and we visited each other's labs gave each other the standard demos and did some Q and A. And the thing that was really amazing when we visited Kurt's lab was that he ran us through three simulations, two of them product related and one of them factory related. And in all three of those scenarios, we were able to find design flaws, not having any experience in ag in the two, two product related uh, demos. The factory one was a, uh, a radiator assembly on an assembly line and there was some uh, racks on the other side of it, and I had the head mount display, which it was that head mount display that you see right there on that screen, also a Collins Aerospace SR80. The head, Kurt was one of the people who really loved that device. He had me reach across for uh, something off of that rack, and I reached my arms across, and I could see where my hands were at, and I was reaching across the rack, and he said, now I'm going to put a tote in your hands that is the weight of the tote that you're going to experience. And, and when he did that, it was a 40-pound tote, and, and it was clearly an ergonomic problem. <clears throat> And I, I took off that head mount display. I'm six and a half feet tall. And I handed the head mount display to one of the interns who was with us and she was five foot two. And instantaneously, I could see that her experience of that manufacturing cell was gonna be vastly different from mine. I could see over the radiator assembly, she was gonna need a stepping stool. So the insight that we took away from this was that more than seeing something in 3D in a virtual environment, you need to experience it in context. You need to be able to do the things with it that you would be doing in real life. And the other thing that we took away from this was realization that they were using commercial off the shelf technology that we also had, but they had customized it so heavily that we didn't even recognize it. So we said, if it's gotta be customized anyway, let's start with something that can be customized. And that's when we started looking at um, SDKs. So what we created, we um, really uh, uninspiring name, a very bland name, but we named it virtual prototyping. And it starts with any CAD source uh, CAD agnostic, we bring it into Anarch Core. That's what allows us to be CAD agnostic. And I don't think Anarch calls it core anymore. I think it's just plain Anarch. And, and the model conditioning is what we're doing in there. And what I mean by model conditioning is um, in the, things, the, the thing that people overlook a lot is 
as designed models are very, very, very seldom representative of as built models. You almost always need to make changes to them. And so uh, that's one of the things that we're doing in that Anarch environment. And then we bring it into an application that we have since refactored in Unity, where we have, we, can, we do the simulation, the analysis, the documentation, and the review, the whole thing within that application. And we can experience it in any one of three ways. We can do power wall virtual reality, uh, large group type applications, stereoscopic 3D glasses, uh, immersive virtual reality, which we call Viper, uh, virtual immersive production readiness. And the unsung hero is the interactive desktop display because everybody's got a desktop. No matter where they are, everybody's got a desktop. And so that's where we get the majority of the value from with this. I've got Christine's picture in here because um, a funny story from back then was uh, the immersive virtual reality environment we used to call ARMS, augmented reality manufacturing simulation, because I insisted that if you augment your physical hands location in virtual space and you're not seeing it at all, that qualifies as augmented reality. And Christine was polite enough to say, no, Ryan, you're wrong. And I was like, oh, but we want to be a part of the augmented reality train. And Christine was right, of course. So um, the first time that we used this was on R210 Gen 5. Uh, R210 is a, uh, a radio that is in almost every NATO aircraft, maybe even every NATO aircraft. And it was stuck in new product introduction. We could not get that first prototype put together. And the program manager came to our boss and said, you think this would have caused or caught all of these issues that are keeping us from building this first unit? We'll give you the model and we'll see if you can do this. After we did our job, we brought everybody together and uh, went through all of our findings and it ended up being a 100% verification. Every single one of the things that had caused the problem or caused the team headaches in building that first prototype, we were able to catch and more. We were able to find things that they hadn't gotten to yet. The thing that we didn't know at the time was that um, we had just demonstrated this to somebody who was an early adopter. Uh, an early adopter not being somebody who is the first person to try something. An early adopter being an influencer within that ecosystem. So this was somebody who was very well respected amongst mechanical engineers within the company. And when we started to use it at the beginning of the next year, um, I, uh, we had a, a goal from our boss to support 20 new programs. And up to that point, we had never supported more than three programs over the course of an entire year. And I said, you're signing us up for failure. And he said, based on what we just saw on R210 Gen 5, I think that this is gonna take care of itself. Well, that early adopter on R210 Gen 5 got word out to other early adopters and they stepped forward and said, we wanna make use of this. And we supported their programs in that first quarter. We supported three programs in that first quarter. We were feeling pretty good about our three, three programs in, in that first quarter. And then the second quarter happened and we almost reach our goal by the, end of the, by the end of the second quarter. And then the third quarter happened and these early adopters, these influencers were out there talking to each other and saying, this is going to make your life so much easier. This is going to make you look like a genius when this product comes into your factories because it just, uh, it, 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 it's, these are things that we normally wouldn't have found until we came into production. And by the end of the year, we more than doubled the goal that our boss set for us. So um, this was our introduction to the importance of tying in with those influencers, those early adopters uh, to help bring everybody else along. Uh, some of the things that this has kept us, uh, helped us find, and I'm gonna breeze through just the top there. The, uh, we went to a flex cable on the upper left hand side, final design, we went to a flex cable instead of having all those individual wires in there and that saved six times the cost of that flex cable uh, in labor and quality findings. In the center one, uh, we eliminated 26 parts, six part numbers and six assembly steps by machining those aluminum standoffs, those six aluminum standoffs that you see into the aluminum base. 
And on the upper right hand side, that's one that a lot of people say a CAD tool should really have found that. And they're right, it should. The problem with those CAD tools is that they throw so many false positives that it's, it's more than what uh, most CAD designers can, uh, can, can really weed through. And so what you're looking at there is a five one thousandths of an inch interference between a divider plate and rivet nut. And when we, we had, this was one of our very first virtual prototypes, and the mechanical designer said, I don't believe that that's real. They took one of them apart. We had built, it had been through first article inspection. We had built five or six of them at that point. And they took one of them apart and where, upper right hand corner is what they saw. And then they took that divider plate out and you saw metal on metal wear. Now, let me take a second to explain the significance of that. These are electronics products. You've got something that has metal on metal wear generating metal shavings inside of an electronics product that had it reached our customers would have been a recall, but we were able to prevent it from ever happening in the first place. So <clears throat> back in the day, we didn't know the importance of quantifying what we were doing because one of the tricky things with XR is that you don't have to do it. You could go back to the checklist. There's other ways that you could do these jobs and people start taking things for granted. But what we did was we came up with a way to quantify about half of the things that we find with these so that we can then bring it forward and say, had this reached our factories, this is what it would have cost. And when we started having uh, this number, the cool thing was that the vice president started debating amongst themselves as to who got to claim credit for the, the return on investments that this technology was bringing them. That was neat. One other fun fact there, the one on the right with the 9,900% max uh, return on investment, you might look at that little group over there and think, man, these must have been really bad designers to have that many design for assembly flaws, and it couldn't be all wrong. They are some of our very best designers, and those are some of our most advanced envelope pushing products, and we we're able to help them be successful through this technology. So a lot's changed in the year since, uh, since I started, started uh, in this space. Head mount displays and software were very expensive and difficult to use. And today, um, you know, a $3,500 headset, people complain about that for some reason. Um, and, and software is like almost free in a lot of cases. And it's really great software. It used to take executive backing, but now we've got teams all over our companies that are just, they get the whim that they're going to do something in XR and they're off and running because it's now accessible, it's now affordable. Community was almost non-existent back in the day. It took our leaders setting up meetings between me and Kurt Chipperfield, for instance. There wasn't things like AWE, there wasn't the area, there wasn't VRARA. Um, and now you can go and we have hired high school students as interns to do phenomenal work for us over the course of uh, their summer internships. Um, hardware and software, these last two bullets, it, it, there were few enough software suppliers that I could try everything that was commercially available. And today there's no feasible, you could almost not do that in a lifetime. Uh, and, and from a hardware perspective, no one knew the companies that were bringing these devices to bear. And today, every consumer electronics company of any significance has got their own XR offering. So a lot has changed. A lot has not changed too. Um, content and context are, are still the long poles in the tent. And content's getting a lot easier. Context is the really hard one. And I think Gen AI is going to make an improvement on that. Give me the ability to simulate the use of this backhoe, moving this you know, dirt pile over somewhere else, and bam, you got it. Um, the user interfaces are difficult, still continuing to be difficult. So what would Don Norman do? If you don't know who Don Norman is, he's the, the author of um, The Design of Everyday Things and a whole bunch of other really great books. And, but we need to figure out how to make these, uh, these interfaces things that, that just work, that have 
uh, conceptual models and natural interactions that are more like what we do in our daily lives as opposed to something that's like Minority Report. Minority Report was a phenomenal movie and I would really like to be able to ha be able to interface with that the way that uh, uh, What's His Face did, uh, but uh, it, it's not it's not the way that we normally do our job on, on a day to day basis. We need to be better with value tracking. We need to recognize that not everything that's Im that that can be immersive necessarily should be immersive, and and. Um, containerizing our experience in, in between those three interfaces that I was talking about, that's one of the things that's allowed this to be a successful solution for people because we're not pushing the wrong technology for the wrong application. And our IT organizations are really having a hard time keeping up with the pace of change. It's really great that these advances are happening, but enterprise IT, it's just a lot to take on to uh, harden these devices and keep, keep them updated. So last slide, as uh, when, when uh, Sonia Haskins wrote, reached out and said, uh, you know, I think you'd, you'd enjoy giving this historian talk. I was reading Anatomy of a Breakthrough by Adam Alter and realizing how many of the things that he pointed out in this book were exactly what our experiences were. You can see by the tabs on the side of the book, that's my actual book, uh, that it was a, it was a much loved book. And so some of the things that, that um, are still true today that were true back then is that like uh, our, our lead off speaker said, uh, XR is hard and you're gonna get stuck and just accept it and, and, but, but persist. Expect that when you get stuck, it will probably be say, somewhere towards the middle. Uh, the the uh, goal gradient effect means that it's, you're very motivated at the very beginning, you're very motivated at the very end, it's in the middle that, that things get difficult. Um, you're going to try, fail, learn, and then come back at it and try differently. So, <clears throat> and then working, work at what's in your control. You can't affect the fact that there are gonna be people who think that something should be photorealistic and have haptics when there's no benefit to having those two capabilities within a particular a application. Work, with, work what's in your control. Pursue and celebrate those small wins. The breakthroughs come about as a result of a bunch of incremental things that happen along the way. Keep chipping away at those incremental things. Um, <clears throat> And then um, seek and serve those influencers, those early adopters, and last of all is make sure that you know what your value is um, uh, and, and broadcast it loudly so that you can avoid being taken for granted and plateauing. And that's it. Thank you.